to present two more of our young people with this Adventure Bible. And it has in it all kinds of wonderful, great information. It's geared toward young people, but parents, you'll get a lot out of this as well. So I encourage you, make over it with your kids. Now, when we hand these out, you make sure you show your appreciation to these young folks. Now, we have two this morning who are going to receive their Bible because of their faithful attendance to church. Seven Sundays they've been coming. The first to receive her Bible this morning is Miss Sadie Little. Miss Sadie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's turn around and get you a picture. Hallelujah. Can I get a hug? Can I get a hug? Isn't that a pretty smile? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The second, now I know her as Miss Addie. In here it says Miss Adeline. Is it Adeline or Adeline? Come on, Addie. Now, your last name is Go Gooden? Godin? It's Godan. Go Godan? Yeah. I, I said, I'm going to remember that because I remember Boudan. <laughs> and if you don't know what Boudan is, it's one of my favorite southern foods. Godan. Go go you know, the Cajun would say, Godan. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Seven Sundays, let's get you picture. Yeah. Give her a picture. Hallelujah. That blesses my heart. How about yours? This time our children may be dismissed. Thank you, Jesus. The English language is a, is a peculiar thing, and with all the, with all the mixtures that we have, we had a, a lady, several families down in, in uh, when we pastored in Louisiana, the, the, their name ended with E-A-U-X. Like one that comes to my mind, her name was Thibodeau. Thibodeau. But, ah, man, I could butcher their names like nobody else. Because it ended with E-A, how would you say E-A-U-X? And I got so gun shy about reading, we used to have visitors cards, and I would welcome people to, to the service, and I would read their name. I got so gun shy because I was butchering their name so bad. I would sweat bullets over trying to read these, because you don't want, you don't want to embarrass anybody. I quit doing it, just to be honest with you. Uh, 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 but you don't want to embarrass anybody. Well, I got this one, and this is what ended it for me. I got this one, and the handwriting on it, you could not read it. It looked like a chicken walked through ink and walked across the paper. You could not read it. So here I am standing up, and, and, and this is someone first, their first time in the church. So I tried to cover my tracks. You ever tried to do that, and, and it ended up eating crow or getting egg on your face? I tried to cover my tracks. I said, folks, y'all know how hard it is, some of these Cajun names. It's hard for me to pronounce them correctly. I'm just going to have this brother introduce himself. He said, I'm John Smith. <laughs> uh, all you can do is laugh. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Well, Father, we come before you, and we thank you for your presence in the house. We thank you that your word says that we don't gather at the temple. We are the temple. We are your place of habitation. Father, your presence abides within us. You said the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. All who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we are so thankful, Father. We are so thankful. So thankful for this wondrous adoption that you have adopted us with. That you paid the price for our sins, Lord Jesus, shedding your very own blood. Went to hell in our place. Paid the price for our sin. And oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, 
At our Father's command, you went and raised our Savior from the dead. You anointed him with power from on high, and he led captivity captive. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He stripped the keys of hell and death away from Satan himself and was raised from the dead. And your word says, Father, that we are counted as raised together with him the moment we accept him as our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for such a wondrous salvation, Father. Thank you for such a wondrous salvation. You are good to us. Forgive us, Father, when we fall short in our praises and recognition of your glory. Help us to do better, we pray, Father. Thank you that your spirit bears witness with our spirits. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to continue our message this morning. Oh, but before we do, uh, we, we want to have special prayer for one of our members. We have a number of families who are out traveling this weekend, being a holiday weekend. Traveling mercies over all of them in Jesus' name. Angels go before them and encamp around about those who fear the Lord. Amen. And I could stop right now and probably give you opportunity to testify about times that you know angels intervene on your behalf. Do we have anybody here that can say, I've experienced that? Hallelujah. Amen. He's a good father. And, and, and angels encamp around about those who fear the Lord. But we want to have special prayer. One of our members is dealing with some, an attack in her body. Miss Ann Huddleston is dealing with an attack in her body. And uh, we want to lift her up before the Lord this morning. So just take hold together with me right now. As we've already prayed, we take hold, Father, on Miss Ann's behalf. And Father, if she's watching this, I thank you right now for you ministering to her right there where she is. That you fill her room with your glory and your anointing comes down upon her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet in Jesus' name. Anything that's wrong must be made right in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we will praise you forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, as, as a child of God, we are, we are referred to in Scripture as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Word tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it describes you. Put your finger right here it's, and say this. It describes me as the, right, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now you can look that up later in your Bibles. It's, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, now this is talking about your spirit man. We might bring my mic down just a little. It almost sounds like it's roaring to me. Your spirit man is made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we still have to work on our flesh and our mind, don't we? But, but, you know, thank God, even though there are times that we may miss it, aren't you thankful for 1 John 1, 9? Yes, that says, if we sin and we confess our sin to him, now, most of us have probably had an opportunity to put this into practice in the past few days. Anybody? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But if we sin and we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from a little bit of the unrighteousness. Thank you for that correction. From, from all unrighteousness. So if all unrighteousness is taken away, what's left? Just righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right standing with God. Right standing with God by the blood of Jesus. That's what righteousness is. All right, if you have your, your notes, uh, I, I want to just briefly cover what we looked at last week. Translated kingdoms, transformed living. Translated kingdoms, transformed living. That title comes from the two passages there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, and Romans 12 and verse 2. 
Colossians 1.12 says, giving thanks unto the Father. Do we have any thankful people in the house? Hallelujah. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. He's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. Man, you talk about an inheritance. Hallelujah. Who hath delivered us. He, our Savior, has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. This is a translated part. Translated kingdoms. We've been translated out of the power or the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of Satan is the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of light. Absolute light is the absence of all darkness. Absolute darkness is the absence of all light. There are people who will tell you there's no such thing as an absolute. There absolutely is. Absolute light is the absence of all darkness. Do you realize that you are filled with the presence of the God of absolute light? There is not in him even a shadow of turning. Not even a shadow of turning. Absolute light. How many of you know we still live in a dark world? So how do you overcome darkness? What do you do when you walk in a dark room? Turn the light on. When you walk into a dark room, the first thing you, you know, what do you do if you don't turn the light on? What happens? You, try, you get all, you, you stump your toe. You have to repent for what you say when you stump your toe. And you, 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 Lord, what in the world? What happened? You tried to walk around in the dark. There are Christians, yes, Christians, who are walking around stumping their toes, fussing, groaning, moaning, and complaining throughout life because, all they, because they just won't reach over and turn the light on. Do you realize that we are the ones who bring, this isn't part of the message, but it is part of the message. We are the ones who bring the light into the situation. You may be dealing in a dark place with dark people. But you're a carrier of light. And one thing I've noticed, darkness cannot defeat light. Light will always overcome darkness. And the brighter the light, the further back the darkness has to go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It isn't a little light because it's his light. But this is also a fact. There are times you may, be, you may feel, and thank you, Lord, this is, not, this is not part of today's message, but it is, by the Spirit. There are times that you may feel overwhelmed by the darkness around you. Anybody ever been there? Yes. I've been in places, I've gone into places, and I could name some places, but I won't go there, where I mean just the atmosphere was darkness. It was just like it was crowding in on you. What do you do? You don't have to make a show of yourself. You don't, have to, you don't have to have people wondering if they ought to call the loony bin. But you can begin to let your light shine. Bless God, I, this darkness, I'm not going to let this darkness overcome me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. If somebody can cuss out loud, why can't we praise out loud? Why can't I praise the, the God whom they, who they are cursing and using his name in vain? Why can't I say, well, glory to God? You can have somebody let out a string of profanities and nobody will even look twice at them. But you have somebody stand up and say, I just want to take today to say, God has been good to me and he is greatly to be praised. And everybody in the place will start giving you space. Why? Because you're different. Yeah, you're different. The light of God's coming out of you and it's causing those demons to tremble. Hallelujah. The glory of God in you causes the demons of darkness to tremble in fear. As you submit yourself therefore unto the Lord and resist the devil, the devil will flee from you. That's not from me, that's from God's word. 
And the literal Greek brings out, as in terror he flees from you. Why? Because the one who is in you, the presence that is in you, is the same presence that came into the corridors of hell all those years ago and anointed Jesus and raised him from the dead. And he, he spoiled principalities. He drugged Satan through the corridors of hell and he triumphed over him in it. And he took from him the keys of hell and death. We're talking about our salvation and the light that is within us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that's not just talking about him by name that's talking about the power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you and me hallelujah, hallelujah. thank you Jesus Whew. hmm I might just take a running spell here hallelujah hmm translated kingdoms transform living. So we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, Romans 12, 2. All right, our location has been changed spiritually. Our, our description has been changed spiritually. My ID, my spiritual ID has been changed by the blood of Jesus. I'm no longer known, known by who I used to be, but now I'm known by whose I have become. Hallelujah. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of what? Darkness and into his marvelous what? Light. Hallelujah. Mm. I don't know how you're sitting there. I don't know how you're sitting there. Oof. And be not conformed to the, okay, my name, my, my, my spiritual name tag has been changed. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. But you know what? I still have to deal with some stinking thinking. And I still have to deal with the natural desires of this human flesh. Everybody here still have human flesh? Yeah. And we still have, we still have thinking that we have to deal with. You see, our thinking, we, when you, when, we often say uh, uh, repetition is the mother of all learning. Well, it's the same with the way you view things. You've been trained to view things a certain way. That's why he says here, be not conformed to this world. Why? Because the world has tried to get you into its groove, into its rut. The world has tried to conform you, limit you to its way of seeing things. And I'm going to tell you something. I have dealt with people through the years that just refused to, to take hold of this. I, if I can't see it, I can't believe it. Seeing is believing. I come from the show me state. Do you forget what Hebrews 11.1 1 says? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, not seen with these natural eyes. You see, let me, I'm going to give you a nugget here. It's not on your notes, but you ought to write it down. Everything you receive from God, you receive through your spirit. Every blessing you receive from God, you receive through your spirit. You have to see it in your spirit before it will ever be a reality in the natural. That's why Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24 tell us, calling it into existence, tell us we speak to it in Jesus' name, calling those things that be not as though they were. We speak to our mountain. That's why the Word tells us. The word shows us as we say it, you will have it. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth, you shall have. You have to see it. Everything we receive from God, this includes physical healing. The one reason, there is one reason, and others besides it, but one of the reasons that some folks have trouble receiving their healing is because they're waiting to get it in their flesh and they've never received it in their spirit. You won't get it in your flesh until you, by faith, until you have received it and seen it first in your spirit. The only exception to this is if the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, then it doesn't matter if you're born again or if you're not born again, if you have faith or don't have faith. That's a special, miraculous thing uh, 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 where the Holy Spirit manifests the power of God. But I'm going to be honest with you. 
I would a thousand times rather see someone receive something from God by faith, which come, comes from the Word, because then I know that they'll know how to keep it. They'll know, as a matter of fact, excuse me for bending over, I just ordered some of these little mini books, How to Keep Your Healing. And, and because... I've seen people time and time again, especially people who, who receive something from God through the gifts of the Spirit, where they didn't have to have faith, but they received something from God, but then they lost it. And it's because they didn't know how to, how to hold on to it, how to maintain it, how to keep it, and not listen to the lies of the enemy. I have a few of these. If you'd like to get a copy, uh, come up to me after the service, and I'll get you a copy of it. Hallelujah. I won't even charge you for it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So, we have been translated, and now we are choosing to be transformed. Be ye not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your what? That's talking about your thought process. Your brain is not your mind. Your brain is the physical organ your mind uses to express itself. Your mind is a part of your soulish makeup. Your mind, your will, your emotions. They're all inter intertwined together. And it's very difficult sometimes to know the difference between your soul and your spirit. That's why the Word tells us it's easy to see the difference between our flesh and our spirit. But, but there, and a lot of people through the years, I used to think soul and spirit meant the same thing. But Hebrews 4.12 shows us that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces to the dividing asunder even of soul and spirit. So if they can be divided asunder, we know they're different. And we've seen in Romans 8 verses 14 and 16 that it's not your soul that the Holy Spirit bears witness with. It is your spirit, your spirit man, the part of you that's made new at salvation. The Holy Spirit bears witness there. We have spent many, many, many hours and billions and billions of dollars on soulish things when the answer to those soulish problems is to learn how to listen to our spirit man who is in constant contact with the Spirit of God. Can I get a grunt and a nod? Amen. 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 I got one yup. Hallelujah. Y'all just y'all are just so so tuned in you, 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 the Holy Spirit's just ministering to your heart amen? amen hallelujah I tell you I heard somebody say this the other day and, and, and I could say this this morning I'm going to have to go back and listen to this and take notes because the Holy Spirit's revealing some things here this morning speaking by the Spirit sometimes I, I go back and I listen or I look at notes and I think that what that, that, that was God. That wasn't me. And I'm not giving me a pat on the back. I'm telling you, we are children. You can speak by the same unction and anointing. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit. So, we're translated. Translation comes first, then transformation. We're translated first from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Then the transformation comes next. Translation without transformation. Now hear this. This is a very important point. As a matter of fact, I have a, an asterisk and I have a, a, my yellow marker beside it to remind me to say it. So it must be important. Translation without transformation leads to a lukewarm condition and often even a backslidden state. Someone who comes and gives their life to Jesus and prays the prayer of salvation, but then they don't, they don't move forward. You see, that's the doorway into the glory. That's the doorway into salvation. That's the first step, but that is not the only step. That is the first step in the life of knowing God as your heavenly Father. And if we don't, trans, if we don't change the way we see things, if we choose not to be conformed to this world but transformed,
by the renewing of our mind. In other words, I'm lining my thoughts up with God's thoughts. If I don't do that, it's very likely that I'm going to become lukewarm because I'm not going to have any need for God. I'm going to think I can handle it all. I can handle life. I got this, God. Just leave me alone. Oh, what a dangerous place to be. It will lead you to a lukewarm condition and often to a backslidden state. Let's move on down and get, catch up where we need to be. If we don't get our love walk right, I brought out Galatians 5.22 that show the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of God being formed in us. Fruit grows. It doesn't happen overnight. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We see the first, the initial fruit is the fruit of love. If we don't get our love walk right, we won't be able to walk in the light if we don't get our love walk right, we won't be able to walk in light. We won't be able to walk in faith. We won't be able to walk in peace. We won't be able to walk in joy, patience, kindness, goodness, or faithfulness. Any of the other fruit. If we don't get our love walk right. Now let me, let me say this, and you might jot this down on your notes as well. We must be love dominant. Love dominant. When I took a hunter safety course, they, one of the things they said was you have to figure out what what your dominant eye is. What is your dominant eye? The way you, and, and they showed you how to figure it out. You make a little triangle with your hands like this. And I, I look back there at that clock on the wall. And I put my hands up like this where, where I can see that clock through that little triangle in my, that little, that little hole in my hands. And I bring it back, 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 back. And the eye that it comes to, the eye that that, that, that comes to is my dominant eye. That's your dominant eye. That's how you figure out which eye is dominant. We must become love dominant. In other words, it's just natural. We need, to, we need to have the character of God so developed in us. You see, I didn't have to think about bringing that back to, that, to my right eye. I'm right eye dominant. I didn't have to think about it. But because, because that eye has been trained. Now let me give you, a, let me tell you something here that's, that still messes with my mind. Some time ago I had, I had my left eye operated on. And they replaced the lens in my left eye. And they gave me in my left eye the, a lens that would help me see at a distance. In my right eye, I can see clearly up close. So if I take my glasses off and I'm looking at you up close and then I look up at the side of the mountain over there, I can see my brain change over from my right eye to my left eye. When I look up for an instant, it'll, it'll be blurry, but then all of a sudden I'm looking out of my left eye and it's clear. Aren't we wonderfully and beautifully and amazingly made? But my brain has come to the place. They said, they said, this may be a little strange for you at first, but you're going to get used to it. And, and without, without my glasses, I can see up close and I can see far off. I just, I'm, my brain has to pick which eye to look through. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm glad it didn't get confused. <laughs> we must be love dominant. Just like, just like we have a dominant eye. It gives direction. When we're love dominant, it gives us direction. It sets our course. It gives us our motivation. When we are love dominant. In other words, the characteristic, the main characteristic, we all know that 1 John tells us God is love, right? And there are people who would try to use that and say, well, if God is love, then how can he have all this crazy, this chaos going on in the world? Because God didn't designed this world to have this chaos, but man in his sin opened the door for the chaos to come in. God's not the author of, of chaos. He's not the author of sickness and disease. A lot of people say that, but tell me which day he made it on. Which day did he create it? He didn't. That's all a result of the fall of man and threw this world into a condition of sin. But thank God we have been raised, we have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. We're in this world, but we are not of this world. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. So we need to be love dominant. There are other, there are other motives. There are other motivators other than love. There are many other motivators other than love. But they will all lead to destruction. Who can give me, who can tell me a motivator that we face regularly other than love? A motivator that, that will lead to destruction. Somebody name me one. Greed. Somebody said, say again. Chasing wealth. Covetousness, selfishness, pride, anger. You see, these are all motivators. Fear, boy, that's a big one. We have of late seen how fear can be used to motivate a whole, a, a whole population. Haven't we? I, I wasn't going to go there. John 13, 35, by this shall men know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love one to another. Love. That's the first of the fruit. In other words, the first, the first evidence of God's character in you. Whew. Now we're caught up to where we left off last time. But we covered a whole lot of new ground. Fruit is evidence, Matthew 7, 15, and we're, we're not going to, trust me, I'm, I'm going to let you out of here within the next, well, I won't say how long. <laughs> Fruit is evidence, Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. What's that mean? They say they're something that they're not. Yeah. Hypocrite. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening what? Wolves. wolves. Now notice how you know that they're wolves. Ye shall know them by their what? Fruit. fruit. What is fruit? What is, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, it's showing us the fruit of the born-again spirit, the one who is walking in fellowship with God. So we see that the fruit of, that, of, of a spirit that is not born again, that a, a spirit that's not born again also has fruit, but it's not the God kind of fruit. And some of those things that we just mentioned, are some of the fruit that is there. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Galatians 5 and look at a few verses up, you can see some of the fruit of someone who's a child of darkness. Ye shall know them, the wolves, by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. By their fruits ye shall know them. Now we saw that the way that people know that we're disciples of Jesus is because they see our love. We saw in Galatians 5 the fruit of the Spirit. And the first one being love. So we see that the believer is recognized by the fruit of the Spirit, but that's also how we recognize wolves in sheep's clothing because their fruit is totally different from the fruit of one who is walking in step with the Spirit. Now let me say this, lest anybody be condemned. You can be a child of God walking in step with the Holy Spirit and still flesh out. Any of you ever got mad and said something that you had to repent for? Amen. Well, when you do, 1 John 1, 9, thank God he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So when you realize that fruit was not a fruit that's seen in the character of God, that's that old stinking thinking I used to have. And Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. All of us have the ability to slip over into producing bad fruit if we so choose. How dangerous is that? 
You open yourself up to all kinds of things. And somebody standing by might not be able to recognize what kingdom you're a child of. So what do we do? There's a couple, two things in particular. Lord, forgive me. And if I sinned against a brother or a sister or I, sin, or I, I, I did something to hurt somebody, I go to them and I say, will you please forgive me? If you're too big to ask for forgiveness, God won't forgive you. Amen. There's several places in the Word it says, first go to your brother and ask him to forgive you, then come back and talk to God. Amen. Amen. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And don't be too big and too prideful to say, brother, sister, wife, husband, whatever, I missed it. I said things I shouldn't have said. I did something I shouldn't have done, and I ask you to forgive me. It's not up to you whether they forgive you. It's up to you to repent. When you don't forgive, it's like taking poison, hoping that they'll get hurt. Amen. If you're carrying a grudge around in your heart, it's like carrying, it's like carrying a radioactive tablet around inside you that's killing you slowly. It's not hurting the person you haven't forgiven, it's hurting you. And the Lord can help you forgive. He will help you forgive. Submit to Him. He will help you. Works without the fruit of fellowship will leave you lacking and lost. Works without the fruit of fellowship will leave you lacking and lost. Matthew 7, 21. I want you to, there's something I want you to get hold of here. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, many of us think that that's talking about baking cookies for the neighbor or that's talking about giving a ride to somebody that doesn't have a ride or paying somebody's electric bill or, 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 or just smiling at somebody. Many of, or, 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 or you name any, any work that you can name. Many of us think that's what that's talking about. And though that may be included, that is not the fullness of what he's saying here. We're going to see that. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out devils in thy name? Not done many wonderful what? Works. Works. So these are people who are doing wonderful works. They were even operating over in the spirit realm in some things. And they're doing many wonderful works. But notice what he says. Then will I profess unto them, I never what? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Listen, doing the will of the Father. Where, up there where that, in, in verse 21 where it said, He that doeth the will of the Father. Doing the will of the Father includes works, but it is much more than works alone. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. Doing the will of the Father includes works, but it is much more than works alone. Works can never replace character. Say it again. Works can never replace character. And there's going to be people who have done many good things and think, I, if anybody ought to make it to heaven, it's me. But he's going to look at them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. How do you get to know him? You spend time with him. You converse with him. You communicate with him. You commune with him. Works can never replace character. You see, spiritual fruit is developed in the greenhouse. Everybody say greenhouse. Now, I know you get tired of a preacher saying everybody say, but it helps me know that you're with me. (laughs) A spiritual fruit is developed in the greenhouse of fellowship with God. You have a greenhouse. I have a greenhouse. And over the door of our greenhouse is the, the title, the place of fellowship with God. 
Spiritual fruit is developed within the walls of your greenhouse. My spiritual fruit is developed within the walls of my greenhouse. A greenhouse is a place where you grow things. It's a place where you, you plant the seed and you protect it from the outside elements. The heat and the cold outside don't affect what's going on in the greenhouse. It's a protected space. It's a protected area. It's a place where you go in, where you go in and seeds are planted and, and fruit is developed and the, 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 the seed grows and sprouts and you water it and you give it what it needs and it grows into a plant and it grows into a fruit bearing plant and people know what's going on because of the fruit that comes out of that fruit house, that greenhouse. Your greenhouse is your place where you fellowship with God. It produces outstanding results. I'm going to ask you to turn to a scripture. Look to Matthew chapter 6. I know we're spoiled with the, with the PowerPoint. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. And don't get mad if I ask you to bring your Bible to church. You know, I, I've had people get mad for me saying you ought to bring a Bible to church. My goodness, I don't, I don't get that at all. Do you? Matthew chapter 6, and look at verse 6. Let's look at verse 5. And when, thou stand, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrite. Hypocrite is a wolf in sheep's clothing. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6 is the one I want you to, to see. This is what he shows us. And, and here is a glimpse at your greenhouse. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. How many of you ever saw the movie War Room? Wasn't that a good movie? And you remember in that movie, they literally cleaned out a closet, and they would actually use a closet to go in and pray. Well, this doesn't mean you have to literally go in your closet, but this is referring to your spiritual greenhouse. Now, if you want to, if you want to go, literally go into, go into a closet, wonderful. But what that, what your closet is, and what the, in that movie, what their closet was, that was their greenhouse. Your greenhouse can be driving down the road. Your your green anywhere you are. Anywhere you are at any given time, unless you're, uh, unless you're, you're otherwise occupied and having to have conversation with other people, you can, you, can, you can say, all right, I'm going in my greenhouse. I choose to go into, I choose to fellowship with God. I choose to spend time communing with God. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to start out spending hours and hours in the greenhouse. You might start off with just a few minutes a day. But before you know it, you'll say, man, I, I tell you what, I think I'm going to spend a little more time in here. I'm seeing results. I'm seeing growth. I'm seeing fruit. The Lord is showing me things. I think I'm going to spend a little more time in here. I'm always amazed at people who call themselves Christians, but they seem to run from times of prayer. It amazes me. It shows me that their greenhouse is sorely lacking. Say amen or oh me, it's true anyhow. Amen. What shape is your greenhouse in? I don't judge me, I won't judge you. I'm asking you, look at yourself as I look at myself. What shape is your greenhouse in? Is there growth going on in there? Have you been giving it attention? Have you been watering those seeds? Have you been spending time in that sheltered place? Where God's character can grow and develop? Or are you spending all your time out in the baking sun or the storms of life? Cursing the clouds and cursing the thunders and lightnings of the world. When all the time God's saying, won't you come in and spend some time with me. And my character in you will help you overcome in those crises of life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. In the Word, we see Jesus giving us example. In Matthew 14, 23 and John 6, 15, we see where it says Jesus went apart to pray. In Matthew 26, 36, and you can just write those down. We won't turn to them. That's where Jesus, 
when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember he went a stone's cast away from the rest of the disciples and set himself apart to pray. So Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, this is the easy to read verse, and it says, The Jewish leaders understood that Peter and John had no special training or education, but they also saw that they were not afraid to speak. So that the leaders were what? They were amazed. They also realized, now get this, they realized something. They saw something here. They saw some fruit here. It says they realized that, G, that Peter and John had been with Jesus. You ought to write beside your notes right there. They'd been in the greenhouse. They had been spending time in the place where they could be developed, where they could be trained, where they could be strengthened, where the fruit of the Spirit could grow. They had spent time in their greenhouse. In John chapter 16 and verse 13, you see, they had been with Jesus Jesus is not here in the flesh anymore, but he said, it's better for you that I go away, for if I go not away, I cannot send to you the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is God with us right now. It's his presence that causes us to be able to grow as we commune with him. Paul told the church at Corinth, I pray that the communion of us, that you have the communion of the Spirit. When you go into your greenhouse, Holy Spirit will minister to you. He'll minister to you from the heart and the mind of God. He will minister to you in you and through you. And the seeds that he plants in you will sprout and grow. And the character of God will be developed. In John chapter John chapter 16 and verse 13 Jesus said in speaking of the spirit he said I will not he will not speak of himself but he will speak the words of the father y'all still with me or have you gone home Whew, hallelujah St. Corinthians 520 you see you're developed in the greenhouse these things, these next few verses, these next couple of verses show what happens when you spend time in the greenhouse. Next time some, next, and this can be, this can be kind of like a, uh, a code word between us believers. What you been up to? I've been in the greenhouse. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But you know what I'm talking about, huh? 2 Corinthians 5.20, now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. The Amplified Classic says it this way, so are we, so we are Christ ambassadors, God making his appeal as it were through us. We as Christ's personal representatives beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to God. When you spend time in the greenhouse, you become a divine representative. You are an ambassador for Christ. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You see, when he's, he's, he, 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 he can't... People say, God God will do it. God's in charge. God will do it. God needs you and God needs me. He can't do it on his own. He said, I'm the head. Jesus is the head. We're the body. He said, we are workers together with him. You are a worker together with Jesus. So am I. You see, you're yoked up with Jesus in your greenhouse. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and, shall, and ye shall find what? Rest. rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I mean, you might, when you get to your greenhouse, you might feel like the world is pressing down on you, but you open up that door. And one thing about a greenhouse, it can be freezing cold outside, but when you open up that door and you step in, oh, hallelujah. The, you remember Frosty the Snowman? He became a puddle of water. All the crust and the stuff that the enemy has tried to put on you when you walk into your greenhouse, it melts off you like Frosty the Snowman. Whew. How did I work Frosty the Snowman into that sermon? You remember Santa Claus came and he went, whew, 
and the, the wind, Santa Claus' breath caused Frosty to come back? Well, we don't want the cares of the world to come back, but the breath of the Father God in the greenhouse will bring life to where death was trying to destroy. Whew. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You'll find rest for your souls. You might be at a place where, you're, where it feels like the, the enemy is just trying to crowd in on your soul. Friend, you need to get into your greenhouse. And you realize, that is, this ain't nothing. This ain't no hill for a climber. Bless God, your, your life's in me, Father. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You, spo- you whooped that fellow that's talking in my ear. You already whooped him, and you gave me the victory over him. Thank you, Jesus. It sure is warm in here. Thank you, Jesus. Then we're going to close with Jesus' example. Out of Luke chapter 4, this is where Jesus... He's, went up, he's gone up into the wilderness after that the Holy Spirit came upon him and he had been designated in before the world, the eyes of the world, and before the, the, the eyes of, of, of Lucifer and all his cohorts. Jesus had been absolutely identified because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and remained. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You remember he went to the Jordan to be water baptized by John the Baptist. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did not eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame, a fame of him throughout all the region round about. You see, Jesus, he went into the wilderness. But, I, you know, when we think about him going into the wilderness, I get hold of something here. You remember what Jesus practiced during, during his earthly ministry? This is the kickoff. This is, this is where he's starting his earthly ministry. When we think about him going into the wilderness, Matthew words it, to be tempted of the devil. But you understand the temptation of the devil was just a small part of what was happening out there in the wilderness. What was happening out there in the wilderness was he went in his greenhouse. And when he came out of that place, when he came out of that 40 days, it says, it shows right here, (laughs) verse 14, and Jesus returned, what? In the power of the Spirit into Galilee. You want to walk in the power of the Spirit? Well, you're not going to walk in the power of the Spirit if you're always out fighting the storms of life. Go in your greenhouse. Go in your place of fellowship and communion with God. Quiet your mind and sing praises to Him. Talk to Him. You don't have to talk to Him in King James English. Talk to Him. Sing to Him. Praise His name. Give Him glory. Let Him minister to you His Word. Pour His Word into your spirit. Go into your greenhouse. And let his character be developed in you. And he returned. I'm going to tell you something. The devil tried, to, tried his best to get Jesus to, to trip up before he even got started. But because he was communing with the Father, he knew he, he stood and he knew how to stand. You realize Jesus was tempted just like we are tempted, yet without sin. Luke 4, 4 and verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me. Now friends, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, what? Dwells in in us. You can say the same thing Jesus said right here with confidence. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But let me tell you something. All, a lot of people focus on the temptation of Satan. He's a liar. You go into your greenhouse to absorb the truth, the life, and the love of your Father. And the more you absorb that, the more you let that overwhelm you and, and change you. When you come out, you'll be just like Jesus is described here. You'll be walking in the Spirit. 
Spirit of God and power. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to, uh, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's good news. And you're an ambassador of the good news. Thank you, Father. For your word. Thank you Father for your word. Oh Lord it's so good. Thank you Father. We humbly receive your word Father. Oh Father thank you for your word. And thank you for your anointing. I thank you Father that we can be doers of it and not hearers only. Father, that each and every one of us individually can see the importance and recognize the importance of spending time with you in this place we're calling our greenhouse. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Thank you for that, Father. I pray for every home represented in this place. Lord, we're translated by the blood of the Lamb into a new kingdom, your kingdom. Father, we see the importance of our transformation the way we, of the way we see things. Father, the world is full of lies. The world will tell us things are okay that you say are not okay. The world will say, you're all right just the way you are. But your word shows us no, we need to be in a constant state of change, becoming more and more like you in the way that we relate to this world, having the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. I pray, Father, that your truth become more and more real to every heart and every family represented in this place. For we don't want to be displeasing, but we want to be pleasing in your eyes. That we too can walk in the power of your spirit. Thank you, Father. We reject the lies and we receive the truth. You're not one who is out to hurt or to harm. But you do intend to separate us from that which ministers death. So we thank you for that loving truth. In Jesus' name. If you've been with us online, we're so glad that you have been. And I pray that you see and be a doer of this word that we've looked at this morning. Until next time, go with God. We love you. Jesus loves you too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Stand with me if you would, saints.